From the day that Quentin Tarantino burst onto the scene with his motion pictures, Reservoir Dogs, and Pulp Fiction, he has established himself as one of the most talented and unique filmmakers of our time. His newest picture is called From Dark Till Dawn, and we're happy to welcome him to our program tonight. Thanks for coming on. I've loved your work for many, many years, and I'm thrilled that you took the time to stay up late and come to CBS tonight, even though you were on with Dennis Miller on HBO. <laughs> that was, I was just visiting there. I was just watching George from the background. You know, in reading about you recently, and I'm talking here about the piece in Newsweek magazine, and I'm wondering how you feel about this. You remember when Pulp Fiction came out, they couldn't write a bad word about you, mm -hmm. and now they're taking shots at you. And I wonder if you think, how can this turn so quickly? Well, I guess it's just standard operating procedure, you know, it's like, I mean, uh, you know, when you get, you know, when, when people like your movie as much as, 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 as a lot of the critics and everything responded, and then, then it actually was followed up by the fact that it actually did well, which those two, there's usually not a marriage of those two things. Um, and it's like, I mean, all the artists that I liked, all the filmmakers that I always en enjoyed, you know, they, 10 years down the line is when they got their recognition, right, you know, it was right. like, you know, uh, Sergio Leone and people like that, their, their movies were given bad reviews at the, um, in their day. And I always just figured that would be my lot in life. So, you know, to be embraced like that, you know, uh, I was like, I was actually rather surprised. And then, uh, by the, by the embrace of Pulp but, Fiction, yeah, by the I mean, embrace of Reservoir Dogs. Yeah, I mean, I liked, I mean, I liked the movie. I I agreed with them, all right, but I just didn't expect other people to agree with them. And I didn't know there was as many people like me out there. But I mean, I think in the case of what they're talking about more than anything else, is um, is the fact that I'm I'm trying to be an actor, all right, and I'm and I'm and I'm seriously doing it. I'm not, you know, like I said, I'm not Charo, all right, showing up in Airport 75. You know, I'm actually like you know trying to you know. Uh, you know, be a good performer, and I think there's a there's a there's a tendency to well, dislike anything where it's like an artist is known for one thing and tries to do something else. Well, and usually it's an actor who branches out or evolves into directing, and mm -hmm. not the other way around. And maybe that's a little bit of a switch and difficult for some people to understand or to comprehend. Yeah, I mean, I think usually it, an actor will spend yeah. years and then he'll say, "I want to direct," or she'll say, "I want to direct." Right, and usually if an act, if a director shows up in other movies or something like that, it's usually like kind of a, a cameo role. He's doing it for a goof. Uh, I mean, the only really other example is like Roman Polanski, you okay. know, who was a okay. very serious actor. Okay. And I'm not saying I'm as good, but it's like uh, um, I started as an actor. That's the only thing, that's the only study I ever did. I never went to director school, whatever that would be, or writer school, whatever that would be. I studied as acting. As a matter for of six fact, your, your academic career was rather short, wasn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. I, 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 I never even made it to high school. I, I, uh, I quit in the ninth grade of junior high, all right, and then just started studying acting. All right, and, and the reason I, I didn't stay to be an actor was simply because at a certain point, at the, you know, at the very like, beginning of you know, me, my career, trying to get a job, uh, I realized that I just love movies too much to simply appear in them. I wanted the movies to be my own. And I would talk to the other actors that I knew, my other you know, peers or whatever, and they didn't like movies half as much as I did. You, know? they were just you kinda, love pictures, don't you? I do, I really do. What kind of movies way back then did you want to make? Well, it's funny because you know, I liked all kinds of movies. Basically, you know, and, and to tell you the truth, when I was a kid, I just wanted to make whatever I saw last that I liked. Okay. All right. I mean, the first thing I ever like tried to write uh, was when I was I, don't know, I was about like 14 years old, and I had just seen Smoking the Bandit, and I just had a blast, and I oh, I'll okay. do a car chase CB movie. I knew about as much about CB as I knew about I don't know, you know Joan of Arc. But what I did was uh, I started writing this script called Captain Peach Fuzz and the Anchovy Bandit. You know, I got to page 30 on it, and then like lost interest and came up with another great idea. But it was like a, it was that kind of thing. But it was funny when I was switched over to uh, uh, being a um, I wanted to be a filmmaker. At, I was about like 22. All right, I, I want to be a master of action. I love action movies, and mm -hmm. to me, you know, one of the things that's great about action movies is, to me, they're very married almost to musicals because when they work right, they're like uh, uh, it's pure cinema. It's they can do something that that only cinema can really do. A book can't quite do it in that same way. They can do it in a different way, but not the same way. Okay. And and that's what I wanted to do. Then I started making movies. I'm like man, it takes a long time to do an action scene. It's a whole bunch of little little tiny shots, and it takes all day. You got to do 50 of them to create a second scene. However, if I write like just dialogue that uh, actors can do around a table, now that's kind of fun to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the early influences in your life I've read were people like Howard Hawks. Oh, very much so. Very uh, much Roger so. Corman, curiously. Oh, very much so. Very much so. I mean, growing up... You, you I, watched him on television a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, I, I watched him on your show. Yeah. All right. That was like a, the, uh, the first time I saw him. I, I remember on... Uh, it wasn't, this wasn't the first time I saw him, but I remember once on your show. He was really cool. He did, a, um, he did the top ten uh, uh, summer pictures of all time. 
All right, and he's like going through, and he's like, the great escape, and he's just like naming all these ones, and Eat My Dust was in there, one of his, <laughs> number nine, I think, you know, uh, right above Grand Illusion, I think. But, uh, uh, but, it was, uh, but he was terrific, because one of my aesthetics growing up is European art films and exploitation films. And in the case, like, in, in From Dust Till Dawn, I got the opportunity to, like, make the exploitation movie I always wanted to make, you know, except for the $20 million budget. <laughs> we got to do it right. <laughs> now, Pauline Kael. Yeah. You read her book, yeah. When the Lights Go Down, right. and you, you saw her on our show and you heard of her from other programs. Mm -hmm. And you were quoted as saying that you wanted one day to be able to, to take a movie apart as she was able to and find out what made it work. How did yeah. you learn to do that? Well, it's like, you know, because I didn't go to film school, all right, to me, like Pauline Kael was sort of my Kingsfield. Okay. You know, she was my professor that I never had. Okay. And I can honestly tell anybody who, who, who cares she's the best professor you could ever have and i learned more from reading her reviews than i ever learned from watching you know another director's movies or anything i learned on the street or anything. she was uniquely able mm -hmm. to tell you not only that a picture was great but explain to you exactly the reason for its greatness oh, or, 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 yeah. or the other side remember yeah. she uh, she engendered great controversy when she savaged the sound of music oh yeah she yeah. Mm -hmm. remember she hated that picture oh yeah, yeah and it was people were going to see it 157 times she said right. they must be daft you know oh it was funny because she was like i remember one of her quotes it was a great quote you know she was like, and every time those children go into their uh block and spiel routine <laughs> it's like, she's just a great writer she's just such a great writer but the thing about it is not only was she a great writer she loved movies and and that just comes through with all of her. she wanted to like everything and um it was like when I would read her reviews, I was like, man, someday I want to be able to, to be able to break a movie down. And I think I, I have. I, I well, have no that question. quality. No question. You know, when I look at films and everything, I'm very much, you know, uh, um, I can break down where it fell apart. And, and she's also talked about something that's also very in particular interesting is the fact that she talks about how where the audience wants to be at any given time. We're following this guy, but we don't want to be there. That's we right. want to be that's here. Right. Didn't they realize that this is the person that's engaging us, not this person? How many of the pictures that were uh, awarded uh, Golden Globes last Sunday have you seen? Have you seen them all? No, this is, this is a bad, I mean, you know, Martin Scorsese once said this, and boy was he right. He goes, the biggest problem about making movies is when you start making movies, you don't get a chance to see as many of them as you did before. Mm -hmm. It's been kind of a busy year for me, so I probably have seen less movies this year than I've seen all year. But like, but like for instance, so, um, this week. Because I, I was like in Amsterdam for like the last month and a half, and I just got back, so I missed all the summer movies. I saw uh, Casino. Uh, on Monday, and then I saw Heat on Tuesday, and I liked them both. And actually, Heat became my favorite movie of the year. I think De Niro is so great in Heat. He's great in Casino too. It's like rekindled my love affair again with his work. Have you seen this picture that people have? Uh, they scratch their heads about the success of Babe, the story mm -hmm. about the pig. Have you seen this picture? I loved it. Yeah, I saw it. In, I saw that was one of the few movies I saw in Amsterdam because they're six months behind, so okay. it just opened. There. It would just be interesting to hear your take on that picture because it is so completely different from the kind of movie that you met you have made. Yeah. What. Well, I, I agreed with everybody about Babe. I mean, I was crying and I was really? uh, I was hooked up into the store. I'm a sucker. I am, the, you know, if you make a good movie, I am the easiest audience member in the world. Buy the I'm, premise, you buy the picture, yeah, right? I'm, I'm the first to cry. I'm the first to scream. I'm the first to go, you know, I'm the first to, like, you know, lean forward in the seat. You know, it's like, I'm, 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 I'm easy. I want to I wanna like it. Yeah, me too, me too. And then that, just the whole last shot of Babe when he's, the, he's won. And I love that guy, the farmer in it. Yeah. He was wonderful, <laughs> yeah. man. He was, like, had such dignity. How about when the wife is watching the guy on TV? Oh, yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, and, and, and to know that, like, this is not like a, a you know, he wasn't a kooky guy. To, to have him walk out there and be laughed at. No, no, no. Dead yeah. serious. It was dead serious. And like, oh, man, he, he's really putting himself in the line here because he's not a laughing stock. He's yeah. a very proper man. And that last little line he has to the pig, good pig, or whatever it is, yeah. you know, yeah. just wait, and the pig looks like he's smiling. <laughs> that last shot of the pig, he looks like the happiest pig in the world. It was like... Pig's an actor. I know. <laughs> By the way, it's not only a movie, it's a meal. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that in some parts now people no longer uh, longer order BLT since that picture? It, it? it makes you think. Yeah, it does. It makes you think about yeah. that. We are with Quentin Tarantino. The picture is called From Dusk Till Dawn. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, the number is 800 952 2788. We will continue after these messages. Back with Quentin Tarantino, and on the toll-free here is Dominique in Chicago. Hello. Dominique in Chicago, hi. 
Going once, going twice, Dominique is gone. <laughs> uh, when you were seven years old, your mom took you to see a double bill that included The Wild Bunch and Deliverance. <laughs> yeah. Two tough pictures for a seven-year-old to, to see, but as you would say later, you understood immediately that, mm -hmm. that you could separate reality from the movie, that this on the oh, yeah. screen was the movie, and, and, and the reality was not that. Mm -hmm. Why do so many people these days have difficulty uh, recognizing the fact that what they see on the screen is mm -hmm. fantasy and fiction and is not real life? That leads them to condemn the artistic yeah. works of people mm -hmm. such as yourself and others mm -hmm. who make movies that have what is called violence in them. Well, it's funny. I mean, the thing is, this is not new. I mean, you know, I mean, again, this is no way to compare myself, but Shakespeare put up with the same thing in his day. In fact, all art forms have put up with it where they, where if that's part of the color of your palette. And it's one of the easiest things to say from this, you know, from the 17th century and the 16th century. If like, you know, if there's problems in this city and problems in society, blame the playmakers. They're the ones. Well, they've been doing it in motion pictures from day one. You right. know, Birth of a Nation did not have an easy ride when it was made many, many years ago by D.W. Griffith. But why is it that people have this difficulty separating fiction from reality? Well, in a weird way... I mean, when I was a yeah. kid, and I'm sure you said this to your mom when you were uh -huh. growing up, Hey, it's only a movie. Exactly. I it's mean, a movie. Yeah, I mean, that's how, I mean, that's how my mom felt about it. She didn't feel that there was anything in a movie I was going to see that, you know, was going to, like, you know, uh, you know... Corrupt you for the rest me. of your life. Exactly. Yeah, she didn't want me to see porno movies, obviously, because that's a different thing. You know, this, that's just something, uh, you know, children shouldn't Don't see. see right. Children should have their, their you know... You know, whatever innocence or whatever, as far as stuff like that's concerned. Of course, but um, you know, but a story is a story. But I'll give you an example of a movie my mom wouldn't let me to see, wouldn't let me see, and why she wouldn't. It was this actually, it was a black exploitation movie called uh, 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 Belinda. Belinda. Belinda, yeah, with Calvin Lockhart. And the thing about it was, she had said uh, uh, she would seen it on a date. She, my mom was single, and she had seen it on a date. And I'd seen the trailer on Soul Train. I was like, I want to see that too. You know, she goes, No, I won't let you see it. I go, How come? She goes, Because you wouldn't understand the story, Quentin. And it's a very violent movie. And if you wouldn't understand the story, all you'd be seeing is violence, and mm -hmm. I don't want you to see that. If I had been old enough to understand the story, okay. that wouldn't have been a problem. Now, that's, that's actually kind of says it all in a, in, in, in a, in a weird way. Yeah, exactly. If, if, mm -hmm. if your child doesn't understand the story, don't take the child to the picture. Ne never, ne never mind the ancillaries right, that appear exactly. on the screen, but make sure that the individual, yeah. that the kid understands the He's story the film. before you take the child to see the picture. Yeah. But you know, I also had to put up all the time with, and it's just a common thing, it's a common thing, and it's a common, all throughout the world, parents treat their children as if they have less intelligence than they do. They don't give their children enough credit for having intelligence. All through, when I was working in a video store, you know, I would recommend films that I knew the kids would like. And I would always tell the parents maybe, like, if there was something, I mean, obviously never recommend, you know, deliverance to a, you know, a, sure, to show sure. to little understand. Jimmy, you know, uh, but uh, unless you know the people really well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd show my kids deliverance. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but the thing is, though, um, you know, it might be not necessarily a, a children's film, but they would really like it. All right. And then, um, and just the parents would just assume that their kids couldn't understand it. And sometimes the stuff that they thought was like naughty that they wouldn't see, that will go right over the kid's head. They're not going to get that at all. Of course. What they're going to see is Steve Martin doing this and that and the other. <laughs> and it's just a, it's a common thing of, 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 I mean, there's nothing a child loves more than an adult talking to, talking to them head on. As, and not talking baby talk to them and not exactly. talking down to them but talking straight talk to them. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? Old people feel the same way and it's the same kind of thing. You know, I mean, you know, when you're talking to really elderly people and everything that are like, you know, getting along, they still, they, they beg for you to look them in the eye and, and listen the, to what they have to and say. And give them the respect exactly. that they had when they were younger. Here's Mike now on the toll free in Pittsburgh, PA. Hi, Mike. It's Tom. Welcome to CBS. Hi, Tom. How are you, Mike? Pretty good. How are you Listen, doing? we got a big thing this Sunday now, huh? Yes. Mike, we have a big thing this Sunday, right? Uh, yeah, the Super Bowl. The, the Super Bowl. Right, Mike. Right, right. <laughs> we're going to win. Well, good luck, kid. Uh, say hi to Mr. Tarantino. He's right here. Hello, Mr. Tarantino. Hi, Mike. Um, yes, I wanted to ask, um, what was in the suitcase? <laughs> Most asked question, well, uh, who shot Nice Guy Eddie was the big question before, and now it's uh, what's in the briefcase. Um, the answer to that question, Mike, is, um, and it's, this is not a cop-out answer, it's whatever you think is in the briefcase. Because, part, I mean, I didn't tell you because I didn't want you to know. I wanted you to, to tell me. And whatever you say is correct. I, I kind of like the idea that, that 
I answer a lot of questions in my movies. However, there's some questions I want you to answer. That way, everyone who sees the movie kind of has their own little movie in their head. And if I were to, you know, say, well, it's this, and you were thinking that, then, you, then you'll listen to me. You go, oh, okay, well, see, I thought it was this. And you would let go of your thought. And I want you to hold on to your thought. So that's why. <laughs> hey, thank you. Well, Mike. Thanks a lot, Mike. Mike, yeah. what's in the suitcase? What's in the suitcase? Yeah. Evil. I don't know. <laughs> no, that's... Mike, what does Reservoir Dogs mean? What does Reservoir Dogs mean? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's another big question. What does that mean? What does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> Mike, I'm glad you called. Good luck to your team on Sunday. Okay, thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. When you quit school, as you say, uh, mm -hmm. in the 10th grade, yeah. your mom said, that's okay as long as you get a job. Right. You mentioned that you worked in a video store for a time. Yeah. You were also an usher in a movie theater. Yeah, uh -huh. The Pussycat Theater. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Uh, Pussycat Theater in uh, downtown Torrance. Uh, like the last rung of the Pussycat chain. <laughs> you know, yeah, well, uh, the big one was on, uh, the one I used to go to all the time. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used to have your uh, <laughs> membership card there. Right? <laughs> on Santa Monica Boulevard, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, it, it, was, it was like irony of ironies, because I've never really liked porno films, but that was the one, the, all through when I was a child, Oh, man, to me, the, forget being a filmmaker. Yeah. Forget being an actor. Yeah. The greatest job you could ever have would be to usher. You know, to be an usher because, like, you never, you know, you get to see the movies for free. Sure. Uh, how wonderful. Well, I finally get a job at 16. You know, again, not even old enough to work there. I just BS my way into it. And I got it. And, um, and like, and a theater that I didn't like to watch the movies. But, you know, it was like, but actually it was like my first real job job, you know, where I had to show up. And, now, as an usher, what would be your job in that kind of a movie theater? Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's pretty much. I mean, you didn't lead you didn't lead people to their seats, uh, no, you no, know, no, to no. two on aisle sixteen or something like that. Uh, no, no, uh, your main job is stealing from the right just no. <laughs> 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 no, no, don't go through the turns. Right this way, sir. Right this way. Okay. <laughs> the ticket machine is not working right now. Uh, uh, um, no, what happened was, uh, um, it's like the same thing. I was just like a. Um, running in the candy counter. Oh, okay. And, the but, popcorn machine, yeah. that sort of thing. The only special thing is when you're taking a tour of the theater. You're, you're looking for guys doing things by themselves that they shouldn't be doing They're in public. The, the Pee Wee Hermans. Yes, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I never found it. I never found one, actually. The only, like, really exciting thing that ever happened to me, and it happened to me in my first week. Now, I'm, like, 16 years old. I'm a kid saying I'm an adult. Yeah, but you're a savvy kid. You're a kid that gets it, okay? Yeah. You're a kid that understands what's going but, on. But I still didn't really have that much actual contact with women, all right? You oh, know, I, 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 okay. I, it was all, I knew it all in theory, all yeah. right? But, yeah. you know, no actual practice. And um, what happened was, um, I, I, this happened the first week. I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is going to be a great job. Um, um, I'm sitting there, and I clo you close the register, you know, for the candy counter, so mm -hmm. you can't sell anything else. And this guy and this woman come up, she's wearing like a, you know, kind of a white trash chick, and she's got like a, a demi vest, you know, but they were kind of big back then. Yes. <laughs> and um, she goes, hey, can I have a crunch bar? You know, and that's a crunch bar. And I go, um, um, I'm sorry, ma'am, we closed. And he goes, oh, come on, it's a crunch bar, please, come on, come on. You know, I go, no, ma'am, I'm sorry, I, I can't, you know, I have a close, and, you know, I, you know, actually, I would have done it later, but I didn't know what I was doing. And she goes, she unbuttoned her her, her, sure. her thing and then like whipped it out. All right, you know. I said, now can I? Have now can I have the crunch bar? <laughs> and you said. And I said, well, here, here. I was like, want a couple, couple of hot dogs for you while you're at it. <laughs> Having the first week, so I'm like, hey, this job is all right by me. <laughs> this don't happen at the Chinese theater. <laughs> we are with Quentin Tarantino. The picture is called From Dusk Till Dawn. It's in the theaters now. The toll free is still up and running. Hope you're next on the line after these messages. We are with Quentin Tarantino, and here's Chris on the toll-free in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. Hello there. Hey, Tom. Hey, Hi. Quentin. Hi, Hi, Chris. Hello. Um, my question is, well, first of all, Tom, you got a great show. and uh, Thanks. <laughs> jumping the gun. Thank and, you. Uh, um, my question is to Quentin is about, um, I know that you, you have a lot of board games, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, how many board games do you have, and who do you play them with, and do you and Ron Howard have a director's duel and uh, play Happy Days or what? <laughs> no, what happens is, uh, actually, I actually, I've, I've, I don't know how many board games I have right now because I haven't like counted them. They need to be organized right now. They're kind of all over the house. Um, I collect board games. For people who don't know what he's talking about, what Chris is talking about is. Um, I collect board games that have to do with uh, uh, movies and TV shows. I, I just like collecting collectible stuff, sure. culture stuff sure, of my culture. We, we all do, yeah. yeah. And it's like, you know, there's like lunch pails out there you can collect and, you know, dolls and stuff. But um, 
they're, they're so expensive, and I like the idea of collecting board games because you can actually, they can function, you can actually play and have a good time. And I, I think I probably have now about like maybe 50 or 60 board games. Um, unfortunately, I've been so busy, I haven't had a chance to play them that often with anybody, uh, could, but I do play them a lot. I play them with Robert Rodriguez a lot. <laughs> could you give us some idea of the titles of these board games? Oh, yeah, well, it's like, well, they're, they're all based on movies or TV shows. Okay. So it's like, you know, uh, um, uh, um, uh, one of the rarest I have, because they didn't make that many of them, is Dawn of the, the George Romero's Dawn of the Dead. There's a board game to that. Okay. I got that. Okay, I mean, Duke's a Hazard board game, which is actually a fun board game. It's about as close as you're ever going to get to actually getting into car chases doing that game. There's the Alien game. Uh, I have uh, uh, the Patty Duke game, the I Dream of Genie wow. game. No kidding. Uh, all the way back to, I have some old ones, the Any Cantor uh, 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 Tell It to the Judge game. That's going back, kid. Yeah, it's, an, it's, an, it's a definitely an old one. Now, would, would this include games that are based upon, like, game shows? Like, there's the Wheel of Fortune mm -hmm. game, and there was uh, the, the old, what was the one? Yeah, it was like, the, and, and a lovely copy of our home game while you're at it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> right. But, like, what was the one that Bud Collier used to do? You remember Beat the Clock. Oh, they had, the a, clock. They had a, I remember we had this as kids, the Beat the Clock home game, where you'd mm -hmm. set the clock, and then you'd have to do some stupid trick. And my right, brother exactly. and I would play it and make our parents nuts. Right. Would that qualify for what your, or yours is? More? Yeah, no, it was, because it's a whole different thing. All right, because those you. were tied in with that show to be specifically that. I like it. I've always liked the games where they like trying to work it into the movie. That's why, like, when I said, like, and they, the remark about the Dukes of Hazard game, yeah, yeah. it's like, you know, I mean, they try to recreate the show. The wildest game I have, as far as like a, a, a um, just from like a weird standpoint, there's a Mr. T game. Okay. Now, the Mr. T game, what the object of this game, somebody at Milton Bradley must have been really busting a gut when they came up with this one. Because uh, what would you think the Mr. T game would be about? All right. What it is is you're not Mr. T. You are part of Mr. T's entourage. And Mr. T is going to leave. He's got like something to do. And you're going to leave on a plane in the next hour. You have to run his errands for him. And whoever <laughs> finishes those errands in a certain amount of time wins. Because <laughs> he's off on a plane. Yeah, you he's know. gone. You, know, you don't finish his errands. I'm off. You're gone, man. <laughs> I'll find somebody else. I'll put in the food. Don't finish my errands. <laughs> but now the list of the errands are in particularly great. Return his library books. <laughs> Pick right. up his dry cleaning. Mr. T was always a great reader, wasn't he? Was he was a great yeah. reader. Yeah. You know. <laughs> a mind is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> Chris, a great question. Thank you for calling and thanks for watching. I love your movies. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Now, is there a uh, is there a, um, a Quentin Tarantino? Do you, is there is there a Pulp Fiction board game? You know what? Okay. Uh, officially, I mean, if, no. you, if you collect them, you should yeah. create them. Exactly. No, I I um I want to. Uh, from here on in, I, I think I probably will. Uh, but there is a Pulp Fiction board game because a couple of cool guys. Uh, I'm probably going to screw up where they're from. They're either from Delaware or Rhode Island. One of the two, I think. If they uh, if people buy twenty million dollars worth of their game tomorrow, they won't care where you said they're. From. Oh no no! It's like no, they made one game oh, one. for me. Oh, I see. okay. And they then. made one game for me, and they sent it to me, and it was so cool. I mean, yeah. and like six of my friends got together and played, and they really knew the movie. And it's like, you know, and you're, you're chasing around the board, and you're trying to bring Mia back to life, you know, the Uma Thurman character. Yeah. And you have different cards. You have the gimp cards, right? <laughs> which kind of screw you up, all right? And you have the wolf says cards, which is Harvey Cattell's character. Yep, okay. You know, and they ask you different questions, and then I started adding on to it. I started, like, making, like, uh, adding on other questions to the game, you know, and stuff. So, yeah, we had a That's blast fun. playing That's it. That's fun. Uh, Mike in Montreal, Thanks, Quebec. Hello. Yeah, hi, Tom, Quentin. Good. Okay, hi. hi, Mike. How you doing, Mike? Very well. Uh, Tom, first of all, let me thank you for giving uh, Intelligent TV to us Insomniacs. You're welcome. Thank <laughs> you for watching, and thank you for supporting us, my friend. And no problem. And Quentin, yes. uh, my question to you is, when you were working at that video store, and you had all these great script ideas in your head, did you have any idea, realistically, that you would become the toast of the town, the king of Hollywood, the palm d'or de con? Well... Aside from the Palme d'Or de Caen, mm. none of those other things were necessarily my ambition. <laughs> All right, I wanted to be able to make a movie, not necessarily be the toast of the town or Joe Hollywood. But uh, uh, um, I did want to win the Palme d'Or someday. Uh, yeah, my feeling is actually, it's funny, me and Tom were just talking about this uh, bef uh, before the commercial came back, um, before the commercial was over, was um, I think if you're going to do anything, you have to feel that way. You know, or else you're just kind of throwing your life away all right, on, on, a, on a pipe dream. You have to really want it. It has to be serious consideration. I mean, I never had a fallback plan because I didn't want to fall back. I wanted to just, like Pac-Man, just keep going forward and have to because I had no choice. What the hell Heading ever for the home that? run. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Thanks for calling, Mike. No problem, Tom. Thank good. you. All right, have a good weekend. What you happened too. to Pac-Man? Remember it was in every bar in America? Yeah, it's, uh, I miss Pac-Man is still in the bars. Was it? <laughs> yeah. 
uh, before I go to the break, and by the way, I, I really appreciate your coming here tonight, and, and, and I say this to you, um, we need people like you to come on television more often, even if you don't have, don't have a movie to plug, so that we can, we can find out what you're all about. And, oh, and, and I hope that you'll come here uh, sometime, even if there isn't a movie to plug. I, w I would, I would okay. be happy to. If a director named Frank Capra came to Hollywood today and started making the kinds of movies he made, would they or could they be commercially successful in this time, based upon what we've now seen in movies? Right. Well, actually, to tell you the truth, I think so. Because, I mean, I think I Babe proves yeah, it. I yeah. mean, I, I mean in, in some ways, I mean, it's funny because, um, you know, my movies have, like, like you know, rough stuff in right. it. You're, you're I, a non-traditional filmmaker, right. but, but, people, I, but people, I don't want the Babes and the Capra pictures to go away. No, I don't, I don't, think, I don't, think, they're, I don't think they're in any danger of going away. Because, I mean, at, at the end of the day, uh, uh, the Hollywood studios and stuff, what they would love to do is make a lot of money with a Frank Cat, with, with, a, with a, it's a wonderful life, which I mean, in its own way, Babe is is, is reaching the same audience. It's mm -hmm. making people walk out and feel good. If anything, our problem has been that uh, after Rocky, basically Hollywood changed in 1976 when Rocky went through the roof. Because part of the thing about Rocky was it was the first time we had seen a happy ending in a long time. I'm going to stop you right there because I have okay. a man waiting. But I, when you come back here, and please come back uh -huh. here, I want to start in 1976 in Rocky, and that's when Hollywood began to change. I think that's a yes. signal point, a, a benchmark in motion picture history. Yes, it is. And if you do us the, the favor of coming in in the not-too-distant future, right. I'd like to start there. Let's do Thank you, sir. Thank you so My much. My great pleasure. Mr. Quentin Tarantino, director and actor, his picture called From Dusk Till Dawn, back with Brian Seip of the Cleveland Browns after these messages.